Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dantel Proctor from the National Student Attendance, Engagement, and Success Center. Welcome to today's webinar, What is Needed for Effective Data, data Tools for EWS, Tracking Data and Interventions. Before we begin, I would like to share some brief details about today's webinar. Our presenter is Paul Verstraight. Paul has a master's degree in teaching curriculum and a master's in educational technology from Michigan State University. He is a facilitator for the School and Student Support Services Division at Talent Development Secondary Everyone's Graduate Center at, at Johns Hopkins University. He has worked for JHU as an early warning indicator facilitator, supporting middle and high school implementation of the model in various cities across the country, concentrating on early warning systems and tiered interventions. Nationally, he provides professional development on dashboard data analysis, tiered interventions, and use of common planning time. Today's webinar will last for approximately 60 minutes with time for questions. We will be placing everyone on mute. Please do not unmute yourself, but instead refer to the chat function on the top of the screen if you have a question. Please feel free to log your questions as the presenters are talking, and we will leave some time at the end to answer them. If we do not have enough time to get through all of the questions, we will reply to all participants by email within the next five to seven days. We encourage you to ask questions or simply share a comment. Today's webinar is one of a number being offered by the Technical Assistance Center during 2017. The center is new. It is funded by the Department of Education, specifically the Office of Safe and Healthy Students. Our website is currently being developed and we hope to have it up and running soon. Before I hand over to Paul, I wanted to share with you the mission of our National Center. The mission of the Center is to disseminate evidence-based practices and build and facilitate communities of practice to help students attend every day, be engaged in school, and succeed academically so that they graduate high school prepared for college, career, and civic life. Paul, I hand things over to you now. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, as uh, Dantel mentioned, I'm Paul Verstrade, and I've uh, been working for Johns Hopkins University for several years now. And while I'm doing this webinar, um, I'm not in control of my slides. So every now and then you're going to hear me say next and uh, to be able to make sure that the slide moves on. So next. Let's see. And I have been working with schools directly um, for, the, for the six years that I've been working for JHU. Um, my uh, a big part of my uh, job is next, um, EWI data. And so when I talk about EWI data, I'm always talking about how to make sure that that EWI data is used with schools. So how can we use attendance, behavior, and course performance as teachers, as administrators, and as counselors? Next. And so when I talk about data, I'm talking about building up early warning systems. I'm talking about not just the data systems, not just the platforms and the spreadsheets, um, but also the, the human systems about how people work with that data and use that data to support their students. Next. And then once they have that data, about, uh, it's about how to use that data to better target and efficiently target their interventions. I mean, uh, when it comes to, to schooling and resources, it's, a, it's always a limited uh, number of resources that we have in our schools. And so, when, again, when I'm talking about data, when I'm talking about what you need for an effective data system, I'm talking about um, how to use that data to get to the interventions, to get to the way in which we can support our students uh, that need the most support. So next, the which gets to the um, topic of discussion for today, which is the EWI spreadsheet. I'm going to use this EWI spreadsheet as my example for what a data system needs. Um, it uses Excel, which is um, uh, pretty much across the board used um, in the country. So I'm just going to be using that as my, as my basis. But um, being able to look at what you see from the Excel spreadsheet, you are able to see that. Um, in your data system. So using it as an example, but being able to recreate that if you have a district data system in which you are able to build um, rosters of students and graphics and things like that, using this spreadsheet as an example of how you can then build that into your student information system. And so next. 
What I like to start out with is this basic hodgepodge of data. When I'm working with districts and they are beginning to, to use their data to be able to support their kids, this is usually where it starts. Next, which then once we can get that, um, uh, once we get that, that data, we then turn it into something that's useful for students. I mean, sorry, useful for teachers. Finding a way in which we can make that data meaningful. So next. which gets us to our agenda for today. So I'm going to start off by talking about uh, why we want to make a spreadsheet in the first place. Then I'm going to share with you a uh, basic spreadsheet, go over what all the components, so as the title mentions, what is needed for a data tool. And so I'm going to talk about what goes into a good spreadsheet. I'm going to talk about once we get into the data analysis part, it's going to be about um, with each of those different things I mentioned going into a spreadsheet, now it's about why did we just put all those things into our spreadsheet? So showing um, how that can then be useful. And so after that, uh, let's say we have our spreadsheet set up. It has all the data we need in it that we need for our school. Um, then we need to overcome some barriers uh, to using that spreadsheet amongst our teachers. So how do we make sure that that data tool that we've created is used as far and as wide in our building for as effectively as possible. So how do we overcome those barriers? So next. So the purpose of a spreadsheet. Next. Um, this is the statement that I have burned into my brain from the moment I started working for Johns Hopkins. This idea that when it comes to supporting students, the goal, the entire goal of any uh, uh, support system is making sure that we get the right intervention for the right student at the right time. And data helps us identify and get to this goal. So when we go to next, the, um, the first step is that it is about students. So our data needs to identify our students for us. It needs to tell us who our students are and what they need. Uh, next. And once we know who they are and what they need, we need to be able to know about that need at the right time before it's too late to be able to do anything about it. So when we're building our spreadsheet, we need to be able to make sure that our data is timely. Next. And then once we know who we are talking about and, we have, and we're talking about them at the right time, the data that we are going to look at is, uh, needs to lead us to what to do about it. So the data that we are going to look at should be able to give us a guide or a map to what we should do. Next. And so that's pretty much it. I just like to start out my presentations when it comes to spreadsheets because spreadsheets, I may love talking about spreadsheets. Um, they are some of my favorite things to talk about, but when it comes to talking about spreadsheets, in a lot of ways, we get a few people that are like, oh, I get to talk about spreadsheets. This is not going to be my favorite hour spent. And so I like to ground it in the idea that when we're talking about spreadsheets, we are doing this for our students. And so every time I talk about data, I'm talking about a student or a couple of students or a school worth of students that we are trying to make sure graduate. And so let's go into what a spreadsheet is. Let's, let's just dig right into to the anatomy of a spreadsheet. Next. And here we have an example of a very simple spreadsheet. I copied uh, this out of a, of a sample spreadsheet that I have. And if you can tell with the color coding up at the top, my spreadsheet is broken up into three very basic sections. And so we're going to go into what each of these sections are. And then after that, we're going to talk about why we've included each of these sections. So this is when you are creating your data tools or when you are building your data tools, these are the basic elements that you want to be able to include. And so next, we're going to zoom in um, the, the beginning at this very first section, which is who our students are. So this gray-headed section here, who our students are. So next, we have, first off, an identifier for who our kids are. And we have an identifier in two very different ways, and it's very important that we have this in two different ways. The first is their name. So we want to identify kids by their names for our teachers, not for anyone working outside the building, um, but for our teachers. Because I do not know it. When I was a teacher, I did not know my students as student number 6880520. I knew them by their name. 
So we have their names in there for the teachers. But uh, next, we want to include the ID because when it comes to our computer system, all the ID, all the data that gets kicked out of those computer systems is usually done by some sort of ID. And so if we have this spreadsheet here with some data in it, and then let's say we also get another spreadsheet that has all um, other data in it, like their proficiency data or how well they did on tests, we can connect to that data with this ID. So as a best practice, I always say this, include that student ID on every spreadsheet that you're making. And so we move on to next. That then gets us into what uh, my boss first, Dr. Belfance, first uh, described as influencers. So this is a little bit about who the student is that influences their data. Next. And what I mean by that is their demographic data. I'm talking about their grade level, their gender, their ELL status, their ethnicity, special ed status, 504 status, home language. There's a ton of different demographic data that we have out there. And so schools want to uh, determine which demographic data they want to include on their spreadsheet because that data is going to affect, is going to influence how we intervene with students. It's going to influence how they experience this school itself. It's going to influence how they are experiencing uh, poor attendance or poor behavior or poor course performance. It's going to influence all of those things. And so that's why in this first section, we have both identifying data, their ID and their name, as well as their influencer data, their demographic data, telling us a little bit about who the student is. Which then moves on to next. And we're going to flip over to the complete opposite end of the spreadsheet, which is the indicator data, which is engagement data, which is how well this student is doing in school itself. And so next, what we are talking about when it comes to engagement is attendance, behavior, and course performance. Um, it, uh, my favorite part about attendance, behavior, and course performance is how common sense it is. It's how if we want to determine whether or not somebody is engaged in something, into something, cares about something, then there's three wonderful uh, ways of showing that. And the first one is attendance, is showing up for it. I know you're engaged with this topic because you're here on this webinar. Just like you know a student is engaged in school because they're showing up. Next. And the next thing is that I know that a student is engaged in school because they know how to act. They know how to behave. They know which behaviors are successful. So, uh, and the same thing for on this webinar right now. I can't hear you because you guys are on mute, but the, your, your behaviors right now, if you are at listening to me while washing the dishes versus sitting here staring at your screen as I'm talking, there's two different levels of engagement there, knowing whether how you're acting right on this webinar. Uh, next, and then the last one is course performance. So we have their grades in math, ELA, science, and social studies as the core classes. But when it comes to, like, again, this webinar, doing the work, um, it means are you typing in questions into the chat box? Are you talking to your other um, uh, participants? Maybe there's a couple of you in the room who are discussing as going on. You are doing the work of this webinar, and when this webinar is done, do you then take what we've, what, uh, we've talked about and then take that to your, um, to your, uh, to your, your schools? and talk to your schools about how to create a spreadsheet like this. So that's how, just by this webinar and how common sense engagement is, how we're able to determine um, who's engaged and who's not. And of course, this is going to translate into um, our students and how well they are engaged in school. So then if we go to next, we're going to describe um, how we measure each of those things. So we're going to start with attendance. And so when we measure attendance, next, there are two ways in which we measure attendance. Uh, the first way in which we are measuring attendance is um, through their average daily attendance. What percentage of the time are they showing up? And so basic color coding of that when it comes to um, students who are not showing up a lot, it's less than 90%. So it is one, if I am uh, missing one in 10 days of school, that is a student who is not engaged in school. And then if we go to next, anything above that, 
we are talking about students who are engaged in school. So uh, students who have between 90 and 95 percent attendance are engaged in school to the point where they will probably graduate uh, with a diploma. Any student who is engaged in 95 to 100 percent attendance, they created a, a track record of showing up and success that will take them past high school, that some research, oh, excuse me, some research is showing that above 95 percent attendance and you have success in your post-secondary career as well. Next. Um, so the next one we want to talk about is behavior. And so I saw that one of the questions was how do we um, measure behavior. And uh, again, there's two ways in which we measure behavior. We can either measure it through uh, referrals and suspensions. So how often is the student referred to the office and how often is the student suspended from school. And then the other way to measure it is um, behavior grades in class. So if you have, um, it's usually done in elementary and middle school, but there are some high schools that do this as well. If you have like a, a, a citizenship grade or um, a work ethic grade or some sort of grade that you're giving your students that says how well they're doing in that class, you can use that to measure their behavior right along with their referrals and their suspensions. So next, um, so that when it comes to behavior, it is a not in trouble measurement. It is a this student was not referred to the office ever. This is a student who was never suspended or this is a student has received no unsatisfactory marks in their classes. And so a student that's successful is one that does not have behavior problems. Next, on the flip side of that, um, when you have behavior problems, when you have an unsat unsatisfactory uh, behavior grade in any of your core subjects, when you have been referred to the office or when you have been suspended, that is an indicator of disengagement. I may be in the room, but I'm not exactly acting right. I may not even know how to act right. And so I'm not engaged. And that can be uh, measured through both uh, that citizenship grade as well as a referral to the office because I'm acting up. Next, uh, which gets us to our last one, which is course performance. Uh, oh, let's just go next again. Uh, one more time. All right, so when it comes to course performance, there are three ways in which we like to measure this. Um, the two that um, I've worked with the most because I work with um, uh, middle school with math and ELA, math and ELA is a huge predictor of student success. And so when it comes to how well you're doing overall in, in all your classes, the average, that works um, across the board. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm getting a little off topic. So, um, when it comes to these different measures of course performance, what you have is the same color coding. You have, if you have A's and B's, not only um, do you have, just like with attendance, not only do you have a track record of doing well in your elementary and your secondary school, but uh, research is showing that with A's and B's, you're creating that track record that will follow past your diploma into your post-secondary career. With C's and D's, we're a little bit less sure. Um, it's probably going to be able to get out of high school, that you're, you're, you're able to do the work well enough to get that diploma to walk across that stage. But um, we're not exactly sure how well you're going to do after um, high school. And then finally with F, next, the F is really the indicator of, um, of disengagement. You're not doing the work well enough to be able to get a, a passing grade in class. And so those are the, the three basic um, indicators. And so if we go next to the spreadsheet, you can see those same color coding back in the spreadsheet. Oh, uh, I think it went to indicators. So next again to get rid of that little box there. Um, and so you see the same color coding on this spreadsheet. So that way you can see how well your students are doing. Again, it's all about showing up acting right and knowing those successful behaviors and then being able to and then actually doing the work. So when it comes to course performance, being able to do the work and then actually doing the work is vital to being able to get a good grade. You need both of those. You need to be able to have both proficiency and put in effort. And so you'll see that when it comes to a student's grade. Uh, next, to which then we get into behavior. Um, you start talking about whether or not they know how to act right, about how to take uh, those, um, those successful behaviors, organizational skills, social skills, and be able to apply those to school. 
then we're going again to attendance, which is next, um, that we know whether or not the student is um, showing up to be able to do the work. And then finally next, this last column here is a great way to add up how many problem areas the student had. And so you can see in that very first student, this student has three problem areas in course performance. In that um, uh, fourth from the top student has one problem area only in attendance. They're still able to do well once they're in the building, but they're not coming to the building a lot. And so that's a, a great indicator that this may cause problems further on down the line. And then um, we get to the, that very middle student, again, another student that has, has poor um, attendance that is slowly beginning to um, creep into their course performance. You see 84% attendance as well as Ds and Cs, but that poor attendance and course performance is going together. So when you put all of those together, you get a good picture of what issues you're facing with your student, about what problems you have with that student. And that's, and once you're, so now we have our influencers about who the student is, and then we have our indicators about what issues they're facing. And so now we have a great picture about what we need to do. So then that gets us to our very next section, which is the intervention. So this is the third and last section of a basic spreadsheet is to be able to show what you are doing to support each of these students. So what your interventions are. So next, um, I like to start with um, EWI meetings. Um, it's something that I work with um, schools all the time. So these early warning indicator meetings, all those color codings that you just saw, is we now have a, a team of teachers getting together to discuss what's going on with our students. And so every time we have a discussion about a student, we put a little X in that box saying, yes, we talked about this student and we're trying to help this student. And so you have a, a track record of who you're working with. And then next, you go into the, you have other columns for the other interventions that you may have in the building. Do you have a lunchtime tutoring group that you might want to put your, um, your attendance to here? That like, hey, these are kids who are showing up to this lunchtime tutoring group, so we know we're reaching them. Do you have a after school uh, girls group to talk about issues that young girls are facing when they're in, when they're in school? Or do you have a before school um, uh, parent uh, contact time where you're talking to different parents as they're dropping their kids off during, um, to be able to catch them as, as they're dropping their kids off? And so next, you want to build rows for all the interventions that you want to track. And I know some people, when they build the spreadsheet, and they've been doing this for a while, they build a spreadsheet that goes from A to double Z. They track everything. Um, I would recommend that you pick a few of your most important interventions, the ones that you really want to see whether or not they're working. So if you have an outside organization that's in the building that's working with your kids and you want to make sure that you picked the right one, that you are getting what you need out of that organization, I would focus on that one. Or if you have a, if you have a couple of champions in the building that are working directly with kids, if you, you know, if you want to track who your social workers are working with or who your counselors are working with, you kind of want to pick, uh, so that way this spreadsheet doesn't become too cumbersome and you're able to focus on the, uh, the kids that you are, that, uh, sorry, not the kids, but the interventions that you really want to see whether or not they worked. Next. Is it not going to the next slide? Oh, there we go. Um, so that's, that, is, that is the anatomy of a spreadsheet in general. So, um, starting with that first section of who the kid is. Next, moving on to that last section, which is the indicators, knowing what's going on with the student. And next, that middle section, which is your intervention, what you're doing or who you're working with. And it's very important to know that during the intervention section, you're not putting up all of the things that you're doing with a student. So if there's a column in which you have your social worker identifying who's on their caseload, Teachers don't need to know all the discussions a social worker is having with a student, doesn't need to know all of the issues that a student is facing, doesn't need to see all of that social worker's notes on the student. They just need to know 
that that student has that social worker support. And that's why that middle section is mostly just X's and maybe uh, numbers or, or last names if you have more than one person. Like if you have two social workers in the building, you might have a column, which is the, the two social workers' last names showing up in that column. And it's just good to know who's getting support from who. Um, you don't, the, again, teachers don't need to know everything that's going on, just that their students have the support that they need. Um, so there you go. That is the anatomy of a good data tool. That is the data that you want to see um, and you want to provide to your educators, to uh, your organizations that are working in the building to be able to make sure that you're working with everyone, which gets us to next. Uh, which gets us into using that spreadsheet for data analysis. So now that we have all of those things in that spreadsheet, now that we have um, the basic ways in which we want to be able to see and understand our different students, uh, let's go through a couple of ways in which why. Why do we want to include each of those? Why is it important to have um, the influencers, the indicators, and the interventions all in one place? And so I just want to play through a little bit of a scenario here if we go to the next one. Why are we connect – oh, ah, I forgot about this part to the other side. So the reason that we do this is also because of time and because of how I think of time when it comes to data. I'm, I, I, like I said, I'm a, a spreadsheet fanatic. I love spreadsheets. I love uh, playing with spreadsheets and understanding and creating pivot tables and functions and all those wonderful things. I am that type of nerd. But to make sure that I don't fall down that rabbit hole of trying to make the perfect spreadsheet or the perfect um, pivot table or the perfect chart or graph with the right colors and the font that's just so, I keep this in mind when it comes to data that when we are talking about data, that should be only a fraction of the time versus using that data for action that um, when we are talking about building our data tools for our teachers, we want to be able to build a data tool in which they, they, that, that time talking about data gets ever and ever smaller, that it gets right to the point of who needs help and how can we help them. And so that is uh, the main point of building spreadsheets like this. So next. So let's go back to those three basic elements of our data tool which is the idea of an influencer, an indicator, and an intervention. And let's compare them to see if we put the two together, what do we get out of it? So if I take those influencers, those demographic data, and I compare it to the indicators, I'm able to come up with gaps. I'm able to see where in my student population I may be missing and not seeing a problem. And I want to use an example from a school I was at recently. Um, in which we had built the spreadsheet, which we were looking through the students, and um, we decided to uh, see, compare ethnicity, which is an influencer, to failing classes, the indicator. We wanted to be able to see how well we were doing with each of our different ethnic groups in the building. And so when we, were, when we compared the two, when we looked at um, ethnicity to course failure, you uh, the, the moment you put it up there on the screen, you saw um, an issue in which this, there was a group of students, um, students who were Hispanic, who were failing multiple classes, more so than any other ethnic group in the building. That it, it was very quick to see that um, most, uh, most of the different ethnic groups, they had about the same number of kids failing only one class. So from the African American to the Asian to the Native, um, Hawaiian and Islander group, they had um, the same number of kids, around the same number of kids or percentage of kids that were failing one class. But with the, the Hispanic students, there was a large number of students who were failing multiple classes. And so it was a, an eye-opener to see that this is a group of students that we missed, that we, weren't, that we didn't know that we were missing, and in such a profound way. And it was uh, uh, one of the counselors who asked the question, what's their attendance? Knowing right away that if they're not showing up, how do we reach them? And so we, the same exact spreadsheet, we filtered it down to showing how well the different ethnic groups were doing based on uh, for attendance. And it was the same issue. 
it was the stu- it was that there were um, about the same number of kids who had missed uh, only a, a day or or part of a day, but within the the Hispanic population, there were several students who were missing several days. And so from there, they were able to look at that spreadsheet and see, okay, let's find the actual names of the kids who are missing and who are failing, and let's get to them. Let's get them in the building. Let's make sure that we support them. And so when we're connecting influencers to indicators, it's because we want to find our gaps. We want to see where we possibly might be missing our kids. We move on to the next one. Uh, By connecting influencers to interventions, we can now also uh, talk about how we are going to support those students. This building had several parents and community liaison uh, people in the building, and one of them was for the Hispanic community. And so it pointed right to contacting and working with that person. If we have uh, an issue with this population of students, and we have a person in the building whose job it is to connect with that community outside of the building, then we need to connect with that person and make sure that we are doing everything we can. So we include our interventions right in between our indicators and our influencers because we are able to then make sure we are doing the interventions that we need to do for that student, that we look at who we have in the building and connect with them to support that uh, that population of students. Which finally gets us to our last one, which is connecting uh, next, which is connecting those indicators to our interventions. And this is how this, uh, this does two different things for us is, When it comes to connecting our indicators to our interventions, let's say with that uh, population of of Hispanic students, we worked with the the community liaison. We created several uh, initiatives to support this population. If if we keep that on the same spreadsheet, knowing who we connected with and how we helped them, and then we tracked their, their indicators and saw whether or not those indicators were getting better or worse, we can tell whether or not what we did worked. So that next time, we can either do it again, improve on it, or we can also see whether or not those indicators that were there before, if they're not there anymore, well, we've done what we needed to do. We can find the next group of kids that need our help. And so that's why you want to connect those indicators to those interventions. And so that's the first reason. The second reason that you want to connect those indicators to those interventions is the same thing about finding gaps. It's to be able to see whether or not we're missing something. So if I have a ton of great interventions for course performance, I have a ton of tutoring, I have uh, a ton of mentoring for students, I have uh, time uh, makeup work sessions in which we've worked with students, we have online portals in which we can support students, we have all of these wonderful interventions for course performance. But if I filter the list down to all those who are having attendance problems, and then I look over at my interventions area, and I see that I have no attendance interventions, then I see another gap. I can see that, hey, we focus a lot on these course performance stuff, but that course performance stuff requires them to be in the building. And we have a ton of students who are having course performance problems, but they're not in the building. And so we need to find a way to pull them into the building. And so connecting your indicators to your interventions, you're going to be able to see who's having what problems, and are you reaching them? And so moving on to the next one, just going to take a second to take a break because we're back to our agenda. That is is how you do very quick data analysis. That is how as teachers, as educators, administrators, and counselors, social workers in the building who are focused on working with kids, doing that quick uh, intervention and indicator analysis, that quick what's going on with my kids look that um, that you need to do that you don't need to be the statistics department at a university or the accountability office down at the district to be able to do this is a very quick student focused intervention focused um, analysis that you can do with a single spreadsheet and so that is the whole point is to, of that is to be able to get to what to do and so with this last bullet point on our agenda, I want to talk about how do we make sure that this spreadsheet is useful? How do we make sure that it is um, used and it is leading us to our intervention? So what barriers are going to come up to being able to make 
the data that we want to make or make the tool that we want to make and then use the tool that we want that we just made. And so moving on to the next one, the first thing that comes up is making sure you have a spreadsheet champion or next a couple of spreadsheet champions that whose job it is to focus and make sure that spreadsheet is being is accurate and being used. That uh, by having one or two people who are assigned to making sure that that uh, champ that uh, spreadsheet is used creates a sort of they are accountable to themselves and accountable to their team um, to be able to make sure that 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 spreadsheet is is used and they can also work with the team and and hold the team accountable to using it. So creating a, a single point person or a couple of point people is the first best practice to overcoming any barriers to implementing an EWI data tool. Uh, moving next, we then want to make sure that there's access to this data tool, appropriate access to this data tool, meaning that if I have a spreadsheet of ninth graders, that I share that spreadsheet with my ninth grade teachers. If I have a spreadsheet of 10th graders, I share that spreadsheet with my 10th grade teachers. If we are a smaller school, maybe a rural school where we have fewer uh, teachers, then it can be shared with all. But making sure that we get access to the people that need it the most, to our teachers, to our social workers, to our counselors, that they all have access to it. And I would also recommend that if one of those people is an intervention, if they are one of the people in that column, like they have a column with a focus list or a caseload that you have on that spreadsheet, that they keep that one column updated. And the champion works with them to make sure that that column with um, their students that they're working with is representative of who's on their caseload. Uh, next. Um, and that champion is also making sure that that spreadsheet is updated frequently, but at only as frequently as the data is reliable. Only updated when I know that if I'm pulling uh, gradebook grades, that I'm pulling data that has actually um, been updated and so that I'm not getting any false negatives or false positives for kids. So if you are a building in which uh, grades are updated only every quarter, then you're only pulling up data every quarter. If it's uh, like a, a progress report time halfway between the, the, the quarters and that's when it's reliable, then that's when you pull the data. So only pull the data as frequently as it is reliable to pull the data. Because if you're pulling grade, book, grade data as a former teacher, um, I, would enter, I would put into my grade book, all right, I have this project for a student that I need them to finish and I start grading it and oh, I, I can't finish it today, and so a couple days later I get back to it and I'm finishing it. But if the, the champion for the spreadsheet pulled my grade book in that, during that time between when I started and when I finished, you may see a ton of kids who are failing my class because as a major project, I wasn't able to finish grading it. And so you want to make sure that you are only pulling data as frequently as it is reliable to do so. Uh, next. And finally, um, when you have a spreadsheet like this, it is vital to um, provide your teachers and your educators with support in how to use it. Um, working with the districts on data, I have seen a ton of wonderful data systems just not used. Like I, I, I'm looking at these data systems and I'm going, it's perfect. It has everything you need. It has the indicators. It has the interventions. It has the influencers all in a wonderful way in which if the teacher knows how to look at it and takes the time to look at it, they'll be able to see who their kids are that are in trouble. And yet that data system, if you were to, to read the, the login um, record, you would see it sparsely or almost not used at all because the program was purchased, but the support for it was absent. And that is, is one of the most important parts. And it's why when I talk about early warning systems, I'm not just talking about the data platform, but also the um, people that use that data. And so that's, that's one of the most uh, vital parts because, again, as a person who loves spreadsheets, the spreadsheet isn't going to save our children. The people looking at the spreadsheet are going to save our children. And so being able to provide the support for that spreadsheet is vital. Moving on, so I think we're done now. Moving next. Yep, and so uh, that gets to the end um, of making sure uh, we, uh, 
when we're creating our data tools to be able to work with our kids that we make sure that we have a purpose for our spreadsheet, that if we're going to put together a spreadsheet, we know why we're doing it. That when we put together our spreadsheet, we have those three important elements, the influencers, the indicators, and the intervention, who the kids are, what their issues are, and how we're helping them. Um, that we then support our teachers and our educators in using that spreadsheet for analysis, that we provide um, champions for that spreadsheet. And once we have all that, then we truly do have a useful data tool that will lead us to our interventions. And so that is the end of what I have to say here, which is moving on to questions. So, Dan, tell we're moving on to our questions. Um, how exactly do I go about doing that to answering a few questions? I will read you what came into the chat box. Excellent. Uh, so Rebecca Yeager would like to know, how do you address student families who are absent eight to nine days, then come back because they know their student will be dropped after 10 days? Um, so students who are absent eight to nine days but only come back uh, because they, it, it's just I don't want my kid to be dropped or get in trouble for it. So part of that is um, using the data and talking to the families to find out why they've been absent for eight to nine days. That the rule that they are that they are gone for 10 days, they're dropped, seems to be catching in people's minds. And so using that opportunity, um, instead of it being a, uh, the, the 10 days as a punishment, you've actually created a system in which there are a few families who are like, oh, I've got to take my kid in there. And so the moment that you have a, a, a parent that brings their kid back after eight to nine days um, to, to talk to them, to use that experience to, to be able to, to pull them in and say, so what are the issues? How can we overcome? Make sure we have our social worker there to, uh, to support them and find out what's going on. Um, I, I think that it's, it's great that, that we have these rules about dropping students if it leads to this. Having a rule about dropping students just so a school can get them off their books and not hurting them is not actually helping the kid. This is actually the better way in which this type of thing can be used because it prompts the family to come in and um, which provides the school an opportunity to get to the bottom of what's going on. Um, I hope I'm answering that, that question in, in a way. So um, just to, to sum up with that one, having a re-entry procedure for, for students like that. So that way um, having the secretaries know and have a list of kids who are close. And so that way when a family comes in and they're on that list, okay, this is a parent who I don't want to just have them sign a paper and walk out the door or I don't want to have that kid just show up and walk out the door. I want to use that opportunity. And so that way when the kid is in the building, we catch them and talk to them. Um, and then bringing it, having uh, that same reentry procedure, working with um, counselors to actually come in and talk to them or the social worker to come in and talk to them. So that way you activate a response based on that data. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Tim Creter asks, how do you measure behavior? Oh, um, going back to, to early on in the presentation, there are, there are two ways of, of measuring behavior um, that uh, you can easily get out of your, your student information systems, and that is uh, referrals to the office, um, suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, in-school suspensions. And then the third one is uh, behavior grades for in the classroom. So again, if uh, this is done mostly in middle and elementary schools, uh, in which the teacher will give a, a citizenship grade or a effort grade or some sort of work ethic grade. And so counting up the number of unsatisfactories that a student has. And so if you have one unsatisfactory in science, then you know that student has is flagged for behavior, or two set unsatisfactories in science and social studies, or three or four, you know that a student is having trouble in one subject or multiple subjects. Uh, so yeah, those are the two ways. Thank you, Paul. We don't have any other questions in the, in the chat function right now. Oh, if anyone would like to quickly type in a question, I would love to be able to answer any that might come in. Uh, so it's, as a teacher, it was always one of my hardest things to do with the wait time, to give people a chance to, to think about something and 
and develop a question or an answer. So I'm just going to quietly give it a second, see if anything comes in. So Paul, Rebecca Yeager asked, do you have a template that they can, that she can make her own? Uh, yeah, um, the uh, uh, talent development does have a template that um, does all the conditional formatting of the columns uh, for you. And so I can provide that to um, the, the center um, to share with the participants. It, uh, yeah, so it has all the conditional formatting uh, for the color coding of the indicators as well as um, several of the headers that, that can be provided. It's a, it, like I said, it's a very basic spreadsheet um, that, uh, for the most part, when we work with uh, schools, they take this very basic spreadsheet and then they build on it based on their individual school needs. And so I've seen a spreadsheet which has just a couple of those columns that I've described and then gone back to that school and they've added columns for proficiency or they've added columns for um, their own interventions or they've added columns for like a, a personality test that they've given the kids. And so they've taken, and so that's one of the reasons why we keep the spreadsheets um, very basic is, is when we do share it, it's great to see how each of the schools make it their own. So yes, long story short, I'd be happy to share that template. Thank you, Paul. We don't have any other questions as of now. Okay. I believe uh, we may have given enough wait time for anyone. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating today. Uh, Dan, tell us anything else that we need to, to do here at the end? Um, no, not really. I just want to thank everyone for attending today, and I hope you all found the webinar helpful and informative. And keep an eye out for emails about our website, which will be live very soon. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.